I am extremely happy to be here with you today. My name is John Lin, and I'm with the Amwanti Vietnamese SDA Church, and we are so excited to worship with you on this day. And uh, you know, I'm in a lot. I do fundraising for a living and marketing, and for nonprofit, nonprofits in particular. And it really touches my heart to see the staff that has put this place together. And uh, it just warmed my heart that uh, that God is within the makings of this place. And uh, I just want to give you praise for that. As uh, we start, can we please just uh, bow our heads and uh, ask for prayer? Father in heaven, we thank you for such a wonderful day, Father. It's for you to just set apart this day so that we can rest and hear from you, Father. Father, I'm in your hands and as I deliver this short message, Father, I pray that you please be with me. Because if you're not with me, Father, then I'm just a sinner speaking words, Father. I pray that, Father, that you would just allow me to give a message of how you saved me, Father. And of how you choose to save everyone and that you desire to save everyone. We pray that your Holy Spirit will be with us. Open up our hearts and open up our minds. For your honor and glory, we pray. Amen. How many of you have your Bibles here today? Can you raise it up? Amen. Turn with me to Romans 5, 8. Romans chapter 5, verse 8. Can you hear me all right? Yes. Sorry if I talk a little bit loud. Romans 5, 8. And it says, But God demonstrates His own love towards us. In that while we were still sinners, Christ saved us. Christ died for us. What wonderful words, amen? This verse is so profound, so radical. In fact, it's got to be one of the most radical verses in modern times. Modern times has this thinking that God is an evil tyrant, that God is somehow uh, a God that loves to punish us for our sins, a God that is distant and far away from us, a God that sits high above the throne, waiting for that opportunity that when we sin, He can zap us. And it's this type of thinking that creates so many atheists out there today. And if you actually sat down with an atheist, they would admit it's not because of lack of sufficient evidence for the existence of God that they're atheists. They're atheists because they think that God is a God that loves to punish us for our sins. But when I read this verse, I don't see a God that wants to punish us. I see a God that wants to save, amen? amen. A God that wants to save. If, if you read it in its context, it even goes further than that. It's a God that desires and longs to save. God demonstrates His love toward us. In that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And that's why it's written in John 3.16. For God so loved the world, for God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him shall not perish but have everlasting life. This verse is so profound in that we don't see a God that is distant and far away. We see a God that is here and on this earth. God came down to this earth and He didn't come down here for a vacation or a visit. He didn't just come down here to say hello. He came down here with one mission and one mission only, and that was to save you and I from our mistakes. A God that is not distant. A God that demonstrates His love for us while we were still sinners. And notice that God didn't wait for us to be perfect and then save us. He didn't wait for us to get our acts together and then save us. We tend to have this thinking that I need to get right with God before I can come to God. But that's not the case here. God, this is the thinking that many people don't want to come to church because they feel guilty about themselves. They feel guilty for the things that they've done in the past few years or guilty about what they did yesterday. But we see in this verse that God wants to save you. But they feel as if they're not good enough yet. But in reality, I praise God because none of us are good enough yet. The Bible says that all have come short in the glory of God. I praise God because Christ didn't wait for us to get better. He just came out and saved us. 
A perfect example of this was, is you go to the doctor. You don't go to the doctor when you're well. You go to the doctor when you're sick. And Christ longs to heal us. Now I'm not preaching that it's okay to sin. Christ says, come just as you are. And God saves us. But that doesn't give us a license to sin. The truth is, God doesn't take sin very lightly. In fact, I would go, I would, it wouldn't even be bold for me to say that God hates sin. Amen. But hear my language here. God loves the sinner, but hates the sin. God hates the sinner, but loves the sin. I mean, hates the sin. Well, I would have thrown my, myself off stage right now. And so God deals with a straight, great struggle within him. A struggle that is the greatest struggle of all. Because God hates sin. And that sin, that which he hates, is inside of what he loves. And let's bring it a step even further. That which God loves is in love with that which he hates. And the reason why God hates sin so much is that that which God hates is killing what, God, what he loves the most. And we often talk about us having bad days like, I had a bad day today. But have you ever stopped to wonder what kind of day God was having yesterday? What kind, of, what kind of day God was having today? Your life will determine whether God is having a good day or a bad day. The way you live life will determine that. And in closing, I just want to give a short devotion right here to focus on to here. That you are the only you there ever has been. There may be another John Smith. There may be another Mark Howard. There may be another Daniel Quattro or Philip Pitcher. There may be another Sandy Garcia or uh, Laura, a Bob, a Hung. But there is no other you. They might have your name, but there is no other you. You are the only you there ever has been. And you are the only you there ever could be. Not even God with all his power and unlimited resources can produce another you. You are the product of the choices that you've made in the past 15, 17, 18, 25, 35, 45, 7, 70 years. You made that special person that you are. Whether you, and I hope you are moving towards a heavenly person, not a hellish person. You're all, you're not only the only you in existence, but you are the only you possible. God can't even make another you. I drive my 2004 Toyota Corolla. No. But I praise God it saves a lot of gas. It costs $17,000. I don't know exactly how many Toyota Corollas were created or produced, but let's just say a million of them were created. And the reason why it costs so cheap, the Toyota Corollas cost so cheap, is because when the quantity increases, the price decreases. And if you were to compare that Toyota Corolla with, let's say, a sports car that is in mint condition, one of its kind, unique, like a Bugatti, a 1936 Bugatti Type 57 Type S, right? In mint condition. Do you think that that car would be, there is only three left in the world, do you think that car would be worth more than my Corolla? Yes, right? $35 million more to be exact. The most expensive car in the, in the whole entire world. But what if there was only one left? In a sense, it would be priceless, right? But you're not a car. You're a person. And you are the only you. 
You are the only you, and if, heaven forbid, if you were lost, there would be a vacancy in the heart of God. There would be something missing in the heart of God. And listen to my language, that could never be filled. God can't make another you. You are his only shot at you. And that's why you are priceless in his eyes. And when you pray, brothers and sisters, no one can pray like you pray because you're the only you. And when you sing to God, no one can sing like you sing because you're the only you. And I want to leave this, this thought with you. That no matter in what kind of circumstance you are, whether you're tossed around and beaten around by the world, whether you're teared up and battered up, wondering if God loves you, know that He is mighty to save and is doing all that He can to save you. Know that He has your best interest in mind. In Isaiah 43 verse 1 it says that God, God says, Do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have summoned you by name, and you are mine. God knows you by name, not a God distant and far away, but a God that knows your name. And as my friends come up here and, and sing, we're, we're going to sing, He Knows My Name. And the lyric goes along like this. I have a maker. He formed my heart. Before even time began, my life was in His hands. I have a father. He calls me His own. He'll never leave me, no matter where I go. He knows my name. He knows my every thought. He sees each tear that falls. And He hears me when I call. Amen? Amen. God gave up everything to save us. Everything. But we, will we be willing to give God our everything? God, it's the best way to repay God for all He's done is to live your life the way that God intended you to be. Amen.